Welcome again to an episode of Learn the TOEFL the easy way with Teacher Fish. Before we start our lesson, please adjust the resolution on the settings for better video quality. And so, in this video, we will discuss about a TOEFL listening question type called Understanding Organization Question. Be sure to watch the video in full because I will be giving some tips to make answering an understanding organization question easier. Understanding organization, or simply organization question, covers the test taker's ability to understand the overall theme of the passage. The question almost always appears after a lecture. As test taker, you are then required to pay attention to two factors. The first is the way the professor organizes his lecture and how he or she presents it to the class. The second way is how individual information relates to the lecture as a whole. To accurately answer these questions, you should focus more on the presentation and the speaker's purpose in mentioning the facts rather than concentrating on the facts themselves. Understanding organization questions have two basic formats. First, they may ask about the organization of the material in the professor's lecture. They may appear like these. How does the professor organize the information about X that he presents to the class? How is the discussion organized? Other understanding organization questions ask about specific information in the lecture. They ask about why the professor discussed or mentioned certain pieces of information. They may be asked on the test like these. Why does the professor discuss X? Why does the professor mention X? Now it is again time to learn some strategies in solving understanding organization questions. Pay attention to every strategy I will give to make it easier to answer an understanding organization question. To start with, pay attention to how the professor organizes the information in the lecture. There are several ways that a lecture is organized. However, the most common ways in TOEFL listening are chronology, process, and classification. Now let us learn the difference of each one of them. First, chronology, it is when a series of events are mentioned based on the time they happened. For instance, the patron saint of England is Saint George. George was born to a Christian family during the late 3rd century. His father was from Cappadocia and served as an officer of the Roman army. George followed his father's example by joining the army soon after coming of age. He proved to be a good soldier and consequently rose to become a high-ranking officer. In 303, Diocletian, the Roman emperor ordered the systematic persecution of Christians across the empire. George was ordered to take part in the persecution but instead confessed to being a Christian himself and criticized the emperor's decision. The emperor was enraged and ordered George's execution. Christians at the time regarded George as a martyr and he became widely accepted as a saint. Notice that in the paragraph, the speaker indicates the progression of George's life, from his birth until his death. This is what chronological organization is. Next, let's have process organization. It is simply when a series of steps are described. Again. Let's look at this example. The acquisition of wild-caught Terephylum altums is mostly overbearing for the species, especially those that are caught at such a young age. First, fishermen collect them from their habitats, the Rio Atabapo and Rio Orinoco. Then, they will be brought to the fishermen's home, where they will stay for a few days while waiting for the arrival of middlemen. Next, these middlemen, and in most cases also the ones who transport the species to various places, bring the fish to their facilities to condition them for their long journey to different parts of the world. This process may take several more days or even weeks. After they reach their destinations, almost always the importer's fish facilities, they are again acclimatized for several days. Finally, when fish importers feel that they are already stable and conditioned, they are put on sale. Again, as you may notice, a series of steps describing how the Terephylum altums reach the market shelves are mentioned in the professor's lecture. 
Notice the words that mark the progression from one step to another. Next we have classification. It is when things with similar characteristics are put into groups. Here is a sample paragraph. The native peoples of Greenland and Canada's northern regions traditionally often lived in a type of snow house known as an igloo. There were three types of igloo, all of different sizes and all used for different purposes. The smallest of all igloos was constructed as a temporary shelter. Hunters while out on the land or sea, ice camped in one of these igloos for one or two nights. Next in size was the semi-permanent, intermediate-sized family dwelling. This usually was a single-room dwelling that housed one or two families. Often there were several of these in a small area, which formed a kind of village. The largest of the igloos was a temporary building constructed for special occasions. This was constructed either by enlarging a smaller igloo or building from scratch. These could have up to five rooms and housed up to 20 people. A large igloo may have been constructed from several smaller igloos attached by their tunnels, giving a common access to the outside. These were used to hold community feasts and traditional dances. The lecture mentions three types of igloos. Then notice how it moved from the description of one type of igloo to another. This is how organization by classification looks like. Being familiar with the mentioned organization may give you a better hand when answering this type of question. By the way, there are other types of organization such as comparison and contrast, cause and effect, and problem and solution. It may help if you can also learn how to identify them. Moving forward, the second strategy is to try to determine how various pieces of information that the professor provides relate to the lecture as a whole. When the professor provides some information that seems to be unrelated to the topic, figure out why he or she included it in the lecture. Listen to a sample lecture. Listen to part of a lecture in an archaeology class. Tutankhamun was an Egyptian pharaoh or king. You probably know him by a different name, though, King Tut. In 1922, a research team led by Howard Carter discovered King Tut's tomb. Inside were, as Carter said, wonderful things. There were more than 5,000 items in his tomb. Most were well-preserved. This included some of the most famous treasures found there. I'm talking about King Tut's mummified remains and his burial mask. The mask was made of gold, and King Tut's coffin was solid gold. Yeah, can you imagine that? Anyway, tens of thousands of people around the world have seen King Tut's treasures. This makes him one of the most recognizable figures in Egyptian history. Despite his fame, we knew little about King Tut until recently. After all, he only ruled for a decade. He reigned from about 1333 B.C. to 1323 B.C. He died while young at uh, around 19 years of age. For many years, people believed he had been assassinated. Yet experts now think he died from a combination of medical problems. An examination of his mummy showed he was born with a clubbed foot. This made it difficult for him to walk. He also had some bone diseases in his foot. His bones were, well, uh, literally dying. The same study took some DNA samples from his mummy. They showed that King Tut had malaria. Experts have concluded that the combination of these problems made him too weak to fight off other infections. That was what ultimately killed him. Why does the professor mention Howard Carter? Answer choice C. Best describes why the professor mentions Howard Carter. In the lecture, he states that, in 1922, a research team led by Howard Carter discovered King Tut's tomb. So he is focusing on Carter's discovery. Choice A is wrong because the professor mentions nothing about grave robbing. Choice B is also incorrect since Howard Carter did not conduct any DNA studies. Lastly, Choice D is another incorrect answer, because the professor doesn't say anything about how famous Carter was. 
The next tip is to listen carefully to both the beginning and the ending part of the lecture. Often the professor will explain why he or she is going to present the lecture material, or why he or she presented the material in a certain way. In a long lecture, the professor might do this in order to improve the clarity of thought. Keep in mind that the main claim is often said at the beginning of the lecture to give the audience a hint of what it is going to be about. Similarly, the ending part may contain a summary of important points discussed or the restatement of the main claim, so watch out for these statements. To have a better grasp of what I am talking about, check out my lesson video about main idea or gist question, I discuss there how a main idea is accurately determined, so it would give you a clearer vision of what our third strategy is about. And so, for the last tip, focus on the professor's signal expressions. He may use words or phrases that indicate the organization of ideas. The professor usually hints at, especially the beginning part, what type of organizational format he or she intends to use. For example, the professor might say, there are several differences between an Asian arowana and a South American arowana. Or, the professor might say, let us start from the beginning of Henry Ford's life. Again it is now time for us to check your understanding of the strategies for an understanding organization question, and see how you'd use your newly learned skills into practice. Listen to part of a lecture in an astronomy class. Let's move on to lunar and solar eclipses. An eclipse occurs when Earth, the Sun, and the Moon are aligned with each other. This alignment can happen in two ways. Sometimes, the Moon is between Earth and the Sun. We call this a solar eclipse. In other instances, Earth is between the Sun and the Moon. And you can probably guess, we call this a lunar eclipse. Now I want to talk about solar eclipses in more detail. From the point of view of a person on Earth, the Moon and Sun appear to be the same size. Therefore, when the Moon passes between Earth and the Sun, the Moon uh, completely blocks the Sun. This can prevent the Sun's light from reaching Earth. The result is that it appears to be night on the sunny side of the planet. Does a solar eclipse cover the entire planet or just a part of it? <clears throat> Uh, just a small part. It's usually a very narrow area. Also, some places get a total eclipse of the sun. This means there's complete blockage. Others only get a partial eclipse, so just a, a, a part of the sun is blocked. In fact, solar eclipses are rare. There has to be a perfect alignment between Earth, the moon, and the sun. And that's pretty, uh, well, it's pretty unusual. When it happens, the eclipse is short-lived. It might just last a few minutes or so. On the other hand, lunar eclipses are more common. They happen when the moon falls into Earth's shadow. Lunar eclipses always occur during a full moon phase and take place at night. They may be observed under the entire night side of Earth, not just one small area. And lunar eclipses last for several hours, not merely minutes. But there's nothing, um, spectacular about them. In general, the moon merely appears more orange in color than white. That's about it. Format 1 Why does the professor discuss the effects of a lunar eclipse? Format 2 How does the professor organize the information about eclipses that she presents to the class? Now let us check your answers for Format 1. Choice A. Best describes why the professor mentions the effects of a lunar eclipse. The professor notes how much of Earth is affected when there is a lunar eclipse and how the moon appears during one. She does this to make a contrast with the effects of a solar eclipse. Choices B and D are wrong because they were not mentioned in the lecture. Choice C is also incorrect because it is actually the exact opposite of what is true. As with Format 2, Choice B best describes how the professor organizes the information about eclipses. First, she describes solar eclipses, and then she covers lunar eclipses. 
Choice A is incorrect because the professor shows no videos. Choice C is incorrect because she does the opposite. And choice D is wrong because she doesn't ask the students questions about eclipses. And so, we have reached the end of our lesson video about another TOEFL listening question type, understanding organization question. I hope that after watching the video, you now find the question easier to answer. If you have comments, suggestions, and feedback, please leave them on the comment section, and I will do my best to answer them as fast as I can. Also, please do not forget to press like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell, so that you be informed every time I upload a new video. And always remember, the TOEFL is not difficult, if you know what to do. With that, see you again on the next episode of, Learn the TOEFL the easy way with, Teacher Fish.